As science advances, it almost always shows that our original human perspective was incredibly limited and incorrect. So in this video, I'm trying to present some fundamentally different perspectives from what people normally experience and trying to give some scientific evidence that points in that direction. So in the beginning, the video gets really technical and maybe tedious for some people. Please just bear with me until the end when I make the main points. Also, no matter how technical I make this video, there are going to be challenges that people can raise, and you're welcome to write those into the comments section. I will try to respond in more detail there. The first perspective I wanted to discuss is the fundamental belief that consciousness arises out of matter. In my opinion, this is not supported by science. Um, science has been trying for a long time to prove spontaneous generation, and it's never been proven. It's simply our perspective that makes us believe, since we live in a material world, consciousness is arising out of that material world. The same way that if you carried a laptop computer to a primitive tribe of people, it would be their perspective that the software is, is coming out of the computer, which might be correct if it was running off the hard drive, it might be incorrect if you were running off of a server through wireless internet. But the primitive people don't really have a hypothesis as to how the software is arising, so they can't really have a scientific belief that the software is arising out of the computer. We do the same thing with consciousness. We have the perspective that it's arising out of the material world which surrounds us. We don't really have any scientific proof of that. There's certainly a lot of evidence that consciousness and the matter are intertwined. On the other hand, almost by accident, science has given some evidence that matter may arise out of consciousness on a quantum level. This is in the quantum eraser version of the double slit experiment. And I'm not a quantum physicist, and my understanding is still debated. But you could at least say that scientists debate whether consciousness can give rise to matter, whereas no scientist believes there's any laboratory evidence of spontaneous generation. So if you had to say whether science points in one direction or the other, in my opinion, science would point towards matter arising from consciousness, not consciousness arising from matter. So just open your mind to the possibility that all matter comes from consciousness and not the other way around, and that therefore all matter has an underlying field of consciousness, and you, as part of consciousness, are potentially having some small constrained impact on the actual physical world around you. Consider that the entire physical world could be much like an infinite series of feedback loops with you as part of consciousness having your small impact on the feedback loops around you. And you can see this in some ways in your relationships with other people, for example. Um, someone who's not very aware goes through life wondering, you know, why is the world such a cruel place? Why is everyone mean to me? And they don't realize they're just getting feedback from the way they are. But consider that on a more fundamental level, that the entire physical world could potentially be similar to an infinite series of feedback loops. Sort of like a dream. In a dream you have no way of knowing that what you're experiencing is just feedback based on your state of consciousness until you wake up. So I'm going to get back to that in a minute, but first I needed to cover another important perspective, and that is our perspective within consciousness. We all view ourselves as dualistic or separate at the individual level. However, from a scientific standpoint, that's no more valid than any other perspective. We could view ourselves as a collective community of hundreds of billions of cells, or we could view ourselves as one tiny entity within the organism known as the human race. So bacteria, for example, are dualistic at a cellular level, whereas humans and multicellular organisms have transcended that, and we have a unified state of consciousness at the cellular level, and we're dualistic at the level of an individual. And that's enabled us to have an incredibly advanced state of consciousness compared to a single-celled organism. And if you consider the possibility I mentioned earlier that all matter is underlain by a field of consciousness, then consider that even higher states of consciousness are potentially possible. Now, I know I've got to stop for a minute before getting on to the next point, because a lot of people are saying, wait a minute, you've got no proof of a mechanism that would allow consciousness to exist at a level above an individual human. Telecommunications and language clearly do enable consciousness to exist at the level of the human race. It's just something you don't feel. But beyond that, consider that there's a more fundamental connection between all consciousness. And science actually gives a mechanism which would allow this, and in my opinion almost requires this, and that's the concept of entanglement. Entanglement's a phenomena that connects all matter at a quantum level, irrespective of normal time-space constraints. And in my understanding, all quantum physicists agree that this phenomena exists, there's just no explanation for it. So whether you believe that consciousness is arising out of matter or matter arises out of consciousness, entanglement is the accepted scientific phenomena which links all matter and therefore all consciousness. On a more immediate level, there's also evidence in biology, for example, that tends to point towards an unexplained link between consciousness. 
Neil Lamarckianism and the research of Rupert Sheldrake goes into this a lot. But basically, things like instinct and the inheritance of learned behavior are pretty difficult to explain with a purely mechanistic DNA-based model. A link between consciousness is really indicated by some phenomena in biology. And lastly, people say, well, if there's a link between consciousness, why can't it be consistently reproduced in a lab? Consider the Heisenberg principle that you're trying to study a very subtle effect of consciousness, and yet you have the overpoweringly strong effect of the beliefs of the conscious observer of the experiment. And if this phenomena is free from the normal time-space constraints, potentially the effect of the future observers of the result of the experiment. I'm going to try to avoid turning this into too much of a debate, though, because ultimately I don't think you can get anywhere by debating it. I'm just trying to give alternate perspectives and open your mind to the possibility that those perspectives could be valid. I mean, you can have 10,000 philosophers and scientists sitting on one side of a brick wall debating about what's on the other side of the wall. They'll never really get anywhere, whereas a kid can climb over the wall for two seconds and know more than all the scientists and philosophers in the world. It's ultimately something that has to be experienced. And everyone has at some point experienced a more transcendent state of consciousness, either with another individual or even with a group of individuals on a team, for example. The problem is that as soon as people experience that transcendent state of consciousness, if they think about it, they try to come up with a mechanistic explanation. They say that that was just some neurotransmitter in my brain. As I mentioned earlier, that's not really a hypothesis as to how consciousness even arises, so I don't think it's a valid supposition to say we have an explanation for every state of consciousness. For example, if every state of consciousness could be explained by some neurotransmitter, then drugs like entheogens would tend to have the same effect on everyone. Whereas entheogens, which are basically a drug that breaks down a person's sense of duality, creates wildly different effects in different people, depending on the person's attachment to duality. Some people may have a pleasant, expansive state of consciousness under an entheogen, whereas other people who are more attached to duality will tend to have a much more paranoid and unpleasant state of consciousness. Consider the possibility that your experience of consciousness within life is basically just a function of your attachment to duality, your attachment to self. In the modern world, a lot of people think they're honest and they admit that life is just a nasty, brutish, and short Darwinian struggle. And this isn't a new concept. It's the fundamental concept of samsara in Hinduism. It's the first noble truth of Buddhism. Jack Kerouac put it really well when he said, who's going to come out and say that the mind of nature is innately insane and vicious forever? But rather than view life as a dualistic struggle, science could just as easily have the perspective that life is an evolution towards higher states of consciousness as we evolve from single-celled organisms to multicellular organisms with an integrated field of consciousness to social animals with a slightly integrated field of consciousness between individuals. You could just as easily view life as an evolution towards higher states of consciousness it's really just our perspective that gives us this view of life as either Darwinian struggle and suffering or an integration towards higher levels of consciousness. There's a proverb about a man who gets to visit heaven and hell, and first he visits hell and he sees people sitting in front of tables full of delicious food, but they're all starving to death because they've got sticks tied to their arms and they can't bend their elbows to pick up the food and put it in their mouths. Then the man visits heaven and he sees exactly the same scene. The only difference is that the people are picking up the food and putting it in the mouths of their neighbors. The only difference between heaven and hell was the people's sense of duality, their sense of self. Consider the possibility that the degree to which you experience life as suffering is the degree to which your consciousness is attached to duality or self, and the degree to which you transcend suffering is the degree to which your consciousness transcends duality and integrates into a higher state of consciousness. You can generally observe this in the people around you. You'll generally notice that the people most conflicted and unhappy are the ones most attached to duality or ego or self, and the people who have transcended suffering the most are generally the ones who have transcended duality or ego or self the most. What I'm really trying to say here is that everyone has an idea that consciousness is arising out of their body and it's separate from everyone else's consciousness, and this idea isn't necessarily supported by science. Science doesn't know what consciousness is, and science can't say where it begins and ends. This idea that you have is creating the whole world around you. It's creating your interactions with everyone else, and potentially even creating your physical interaction with the matter around you. And yet it's only an idea. You have no real proof that it's true. It's just your perspective. Try to experience and to maintain a more transcendent state of consciousness and see if everything doesn't suddenly change. 
And people may say, well, that's just your theory and I experience consciousness the way I do and there's nothing to be done about it. I would point out again that everyone has at some time experienced a more transcendent state of consciousness. The problem is maintaining that state. It's difficult to maintain a transcendent state of consciousness because all of the feedback that we get from the world around us and our relationships with everyone else were premised on our previous state of consciousness, which was dualistic at a certain level. So in order to overcome that negative feedback, it's first necessary to start acting with a sense of unity towards other life and then gradually overcome that negative feedback through our actions. But rather than just philosophize about it, why not run a personal experiment? Go out and do something to help another individual or even an animal who has no way of repaying you so that you're certain it's a selfless act and see if you don't also feel this improved and transcendent state of consciousness.